It's February 18th, 1478, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Most of us have had a couple of occasions where we've ingested enough wine to drown in. But on this day, George, first Duke of Clarence, (laughs) supposedly became the first person to test this theory when he was executed by being drowned in a butt of his favourite tipple, Malmsey wine. It's recorded actually by Shakespeare ever so slightly differently. He has uh, George both stabbed and then chucked in an enormous bucket of wine. But interestingly, he does dwell on the drowning aspect and he has George... George experienced this sort of dream slash premonition where he goes, Oh Lord, methought what pain it was to drown, what dreadful noise of waters in my ears, what sights of ugly death within mine eyes. Yes, and there is some evidence that maybe he did indeed drown in wine, his favourite wine, but we will come to that because I think first we do need to explain why. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Um, So, He was, as Rebecca says, uh, the first Duke of Clarence, which means he was um, what they used to call then the second person. So he had been second in line to the throne of Edward IV, who was his older brother. Richard III was next in line. But these were days when being so tantalisingly close to the big job couldn't be sated by an interview with Oprah Winfrey and marrying a Hollywood star. (laughs) You just felt constant disappointment and inevitably people who thought you'd be a better king would, would come to you and tell you so. And Mm. unfortunately, George did seem to succumb to some plotting. Yeah. So if the Yorkist faction in the War of the Roses had been the Godfather, then George, Duke of Clarence, would have been Fredo. (laughs) (laughs) He had a serious inferiority complex, it seems, and he was attracted to anyone who showed him any interest whatsoever, which just happened to be the instigator of the rebellion against his brother, Edward IV, the Earl of Warwick. So the Earl of Warwick had actually Mm. been one of Edward IV's biggest supporters when he was trying to gain the throne. But then when he did, he basically thought of himself as a power behind the throne and he was trying to negotiate a marriage for Edward to the daughter of the King of France. But then Edward went behind his back and married somebody else and and even more annoyingly a very very minor noble Elizabeth Woodville Mm. which outraged him and turned the Duke of Warwick against Edward and then he did the thing that you do he tried to turn the family against him and he succeeded it appears in turning George George actually ended up marrying Mm. the Duke of Warwick's daughter so they ended up being these co-conspirators against Edward he was involved in lots of attempts to unseat the king but the one that ultimately ended up with him being executed on this day Uh, was he decided to cast doubts on the legitimacy of that marriage of King Edward to his wife Elizabeth because they had been married in private because she was a minor aristocrat, not considered a suitable bride. So it was kind of thought the best thing would be to kind of present her to the public when it was a fait accompli and they were married and she was pregnant with his son and all the rest of it. So there was some question about the marriage because it hadn't been conducted with a big public fanfare And what he did was try and cast doubt on whether the marriage was legitimate and therefore whether the boys that had issued forth were bastards and therefore putting himself in line to the throne. Because it followed that if he could say the marriage wasn't legitimate because he alleged Edward had been married at the same time to someone else, then he was the rightful king. And this ended up with George being put on trial in Parliament, uh, with King Edward watching on and no one daring to speak up in George's favour because the Queen was watching on. (laughs) And George was found guilty of, quote, unnatural loath treasons and sentenced Mm. to the Tower of London. And I don't advocate drowning people in butts of Malmsey wine or indeed butts of anything else. (laughs) But I have to say that this did cap off a decade-long spree of plotting from George. This had been going on since the late 1460s and in fact the first time that he got involved with these uh, uprisings that were being fanned by the Duke of Warwick, Edward astonishingly just seemed to forgive him. He reconciled both with George and with Warwick who promptly decamped to France formed a plot with the deposed Queen Margaret of Anjou to restore her husband, the former Henry VI to the throne. And crucially this deal included making George second in line to the throne after to Henry's own son. So once again, George oh, seems wow. to have been influenced by that route back to power. Suddenly being second seems good, does it, George? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they actually pulled it off. They they came back to England, raised an army, and Henry VI was actually returned to the throne for a while. Edward just about managed to escape in time. Mm. He fled to Flanders. And this was called the re-adaption, a word I'd never seen on her before, which means like a regaining. 
of Henry VI, but it was really short-lived. Henry was very feeble, uh, and the coalition behind him was pretty uneasy, considering that Warwick had obviously previously been Edward's biggest supporter and had actually, you know, killed family members of a lot of the people that he was now in bed with. But it all ended for George when Warwick married his other daughter. So George was married to his daughter Isabel. <laughs> he married his other daughter Anne to Henry's son, who was next in line to the throne. A move that obviously was extremely likely to block George's route to the throne. And he ended up crawling back to the surprisingly forbearing Edward. I'm always amazed at those bits of reconciliation between Edward and George because, you know, he was actually plotting <laughs> to genuinely kill and or usurp him. So it must have been a case of... You know, you keep your friends close and your enemies even closer. He must have been thinking he's a threat as long as he's outside of my circle. So bring him broadly within my circle and I can prevent him from leading further rebellions or bringing armies against me. But it didn't work terribly well. <laughs> but also, he had the other brother to play him off, didn't he? That was the thing. So he had Richard III yeah. as well to negotiate with. So he could kind of oscillate his plots between the two. And Shakespeare yes. has this, doesn't he, in Richard III? Act 1, scene 4, everybody, get ready. Turn your pages. Uh, <laughs> this is when Clarence is about to be murdered in his version. Um, Clarence pleads with the murderer, Oh, if you love my brother, hate not me. I am his brother and I love him well. If you be hired for me, go back again and I will send you to my brother, Gloucester, who shall reward you better for my life than Edward will for tidings of my death. To which the second murderer replies, you are deceived, your brother Gloucester hates you. <laughs> which I think is pretty sassy, just before you're about to stab someone. <laughs> Incidentally, second murderer is one of the roles I would have got at school. <laughs> Edward's oldest son was only 12 when he died, so he had left the throne in the hands of his brother Richard, who, yes, as you've already spoiled, it turns out was Richard III all along. Uh, and he promptly <laughs> showed his gratitude by probably murdering Edward's oldest sons, the princes in the tower and <laughs> declaring most of his other kids illegitimate using that very same mechanism you mentioned earlier Ollie of saying that his marriage had yeah he was like god <laughs> George is so evil trying to say your kids are illegitimate and then as soon as Edward died he's like boy those kids sure are illegitimate I better stay on the throne <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we've got to the wine bit so let's do yeah. the, the Malmsey wine right first of all what is Malmsey wine well it's a type <laughs> of Madeira uh which it's a bit like a dessert wine and was apparently George's favourite tipple. So mm -hmm. the idea being he was sentenced to the Tower of London, he was sentenced to execution, but because he was an aristocrat, he was given the choice. How would you like to die? And his answer was, I'd like to be drowned in a bucket of Madeira. But because <laughs> he was royal, people were like, OK, yeah, we could sort that for you. Oh, yeah, I actually looked into how much it would cost to drown yourself in a, a bat of Malmsey wine, if that was what you wanted to do these days. Bottles actually tend to hover around £20, regardless of your supermarket of choice. And a buttload, as a, <laughs> a butt full of, of uh, wine is called, uh, is about 550 litres, so about 680 bottles by my calculations. Right. An average bottle of wine being £20. So to do it would cost you £13,400. A history podcast, everybody. This podcast is <laughs> filed under it. the category history. <laughs> <laughs> But I think the Malmsey wine story gets its legitimacy from being depicted in Shakespeare. In mm. terms of whether there is yeah. any historical evidence that it happened, while it does sound quite outlandish, there was indeed a taboo against spilling royal blood. And obviously the standard method of execution at the time was beheading. So it is possible that another method was chosen. And they did exhume some remains at Tewkesbury Abbey, which was... George, Duke of Clarence's estate. And some people think that it was him. It was next to what is thought to be the grave of his wife, so possibly him. And if that was him, then he wasn't beheaded because his you know, his head joint was where it should be. It, was still it wasn't underneath his arm or anything. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there is a portrait of his daughter, Margaret Countess of Salisbury, wearing a charm around her wrist, which is shaped like a barrel. And I mean, you you can see this portrait and it has, you know, clearly on her instruction been put there by the artist. She's symbolically wearing some jewellery that is shaped like a barrel. It's that is a weird thing for a royal to wear in a picture, unless it's a tribute to that. Pandora's new charm range, commemorate the manner of your father's passing. <laughs> <laughs> Things didn't end that well for Margaret, though, uh, his daughter. Well, better than for his son. So George's son was executed at the age of 24 because they were worried that he would be plotting too. They let the woman live. And she did live till 67, became, uh, you know, an established part of the aristocracy. Hence, she has her portrait done. 
Uh, but uh, at the age of 67, Henry VIII decided she was too much of a risk to him, so he executed her. But without the option to uh, choose the liquid in which she was going to be <laughs> drowned. <laughs> yeah. anyway, what would you go for, by the way? I, I think hummus for me. Oh, Oof. God, but it's so thick. <laughs> would you be allowed to drown in the layer of olive oil on the top? <laughs> Next time. He was hijacked in 92, <laughs> 95 and 96. It begins to look like carelessness, doesn't it? Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.